Yu-Gi-Oh! has been around for over a decade and has released a ton of cards throughout the years. Some of these cards are great, some not so much, and some are right in between. So in this series, we look at some of the more unknown things about Yu-Gi-Oh! that you probably wouldn't see in normal videos. In today's episode, we're going to be covering just interesting artworks. The first card in our video is Manga Ruran. This is a level 7 Dragon Toon monster with 2200 attack and 2600 defense. This card has the old school Toon World archetypal effect, where you can special summon Manga Ruran from your hand by tributing two monsters while you control Toon World, but you have to pay 500 life points to attack with the monster, and Toon World needs to be on the field or Manga Ruran destroys himself. However, the payoff is that Manga Ruran can attack your opponent's life points directly with 2200 attack. And all the other old Toon World cards have similar effects, where they can attack directly with pretty decent attack points, but cost 500 life points in order to do so each time, and have to wait a turn before they can attack. Manga Ruran is based off of another card, much like lots of the other Toon Monsters. The one this one is based off of is a level 7 Dragon Normal Monster, called Ruran, as the name implies. The monster is essentially the same, as they share the same stat line, name, and design features. If you have the card side by side, you can really see the similarities. The real difference is that with Manga Ruran, you can actually see the full dragon rather than hiding in its egg. But for some unknown reason, the shell of the egg switches color from white and blue spots on Ruran to dark blue and blue spots on Manga Rurans. In the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, when the monster was in attack position, you'd be able to see the actual dragon, and when it was in defense position, it would hide back inside its shell like you see it in the actual card artwork. But why Manga Ruran is on this list is the artwork of the card and some of the lore behind it. First of all, the Manga Ruran is the only Toon monster without Toon in the actual name, and it did despite the entire archetype being Toon versions of cards, and is the only fire attribute Toon monster in the game. Although it's not the same case as the Japanese version of the card, as that version of the card is just called Toon Dragon Eager. The whole misnaming of Manga Ruran comes from the manga chapter of Yugi's Duel with Pegasus, where Pegasus makes fun of Yugi's Japanese because apparently he spoke really bad Japanese. So, Yugi calls Toon Dragon Eager the original card, Manga Ruran, which is just a wrong translation of the card. And when four kids localized the anime for Western audiences, they kept the name as Manga Ruran. On top of the weird name, Manga Ruran has a weirdly high amount of erratas over the years since its release. Erratas are basically when Konami changes aspects of a card, and typically it's because an effect is too good, and they want to reprint the card rather than throw it in the forbidden list. Most cards get one or two erratas if they're lucky, or more if their effects are just way too good, but Manga Ruran has had a total of five different erratas. All of the erratas focus on the wording of Manga Ruran's effect, so nothing too world shattering. Regardless, five erratas is still a weirdly high amount for a niche card like Manga Ruran. This card is also arguably the most cartoony of the Toon monsters, and in the anime when Manga Ruran is summoned, the monster has a giggle that is alarmingly similar to Scooby-Doo. Unfortunately, I can't really show the clipper audio, but if you google Manga Ruran's giggle in the anime, I'm sure you'll be able to find it. Next up, we have Gigabyte, a simple level 1 vanilla reptile nor monster with 350 attack and 300 defense, and has the flavor text, he has a tranquil soul, but carries a destiny that one day his heart shall be tainted by evil which is surprisingly sinister for how cute the little lizard is. If Gigabyte looks familiar, well, it should, because there's a whole story to Gigabyte, and the monster is featured in tons of card artworks. Outside of the lore card series of Dual Terminal, World Legacy, and Albaz, Gigabyte is one of the cards that appears the most in the artworks of other cards, appearing in seven cards in this form alone. So Gigabyte is the first form of the Gaga Gigo series of monsters. Think of Pokemon Evolutions, where Pokemon goes through different stages of evolutions to stronger forms. But in this case, rather than three evolutions, there are a total of five. So the full evolution line is Gigabyte, goes into Gigabyte, to Gaga Gigo, to Giga Gaga Gigo, to Goga Gaga Gigo, and then finally Gaga Gigo the Risen. And interesting enough, the base form, Gigabyte, actually references his evolution with the flavor text when it reads that his heart will be tainted by evil, which causes some of the evolutions that Gigabyte has. Now, back to what I mentioned about the Gigabytes being in a lot of card artworks. The entire evolution line appears across 28 different cards, excluding their own. This is because Gigabyte also is a key character in the Charmer archetype, and Gigabyte and Gaga Gigo are Irina the Water Charmer's companions. The archetypes are basically elemental spellcasters for each of the elemental attributes, fire, water, earth, and wind. Each of the Charmers has a corresponding companion creature of the same attribute. So with water, there's Gigabyte, and for earth, there's Archfiend Marment of Nefiriousness, and so on and so on. And as the story goes, the Charmers, who were kids, trained up mastering their arts growing with their companions. And after some time, the Charmers learned to harness the power of their companions, and with training, the companions evolved. And in the case of Gigabyte, it evolved into Gigabyte, and then subsequently Gaga Gigo. While in this form, we get to see Gaga Gigo appear in a bunch of card artworks. Then, after the story of the Charmers, there's a whole different story with Gaga Gigo and the Marauding Captain teaming up to fight different threats, which would honestly make kind of a decent Netflix show or cop movie if you ask me. 
But the evolution of Gagagigo continues after the Charmers as it kept on evolving to its final form, Gogogigo Gagagigo, which is a level 8 Reptile Nor monster with 2950 attack and 2800 defense, which wasn't a terrible beat stick for the time, but still not good enough to be used. However, in the early XZ's era, Konami released a new form of Gagagigo, Gagagigo the Risen. This is one of two XZ's non-effect monsters in the game, with the other being Gem Knight Pearl. It carries the same stat line as the previous iterations of 2950 attack and 2800 defense, and requires three level 4 monsters to be brought out. But despite the high summoning cost for a level 4 XZ's monster, Gagagigo the Risen actually saw play in some Fire Fist decks as a pretty strong beat stick. But back to appearances and card arts. So, instead of going through each and all of the 28 different appearances that the Gaga Gigo line comes up in, I'll go over some interesting instances. So, starting with Gigabyte itself, the most important artwork that it's featured on is Area the Water Charmer and Raging Area, which is also another variant of the Water Charmer, but we've already gone over that. Gigabyte also appears on the Of the Normal series, so Law of the Normal, the Revenge of the Normal, and the Return of the Normal, which are all cards that focus on powering up low-level Nor monsters, or just supporting level 4 lower monsters. Lastly, for Gigabyte, it's featured in Triangle Power, which also is along the lines of powering up Nor monsters. With Gagagigo, there's a lot more appearances. Like its previous form, Gagagigo also appears in the Charmer cards like Familiar Princess Area, which isn't really a surprise, but also appears in the Water Attribute Floodgate called Ice Spawn. And then, with the story of him and the Marauding Captain, they are featured in a bunch of other card artworks together, fighting or working together. Their teamwork is shown as cards like My Body as a Shield, which, fun fact, is a card that actually came before Gagagigo itself was released. And the two are also featured on Two Man Cell Battle and Draining Shield. But probably the most popular cards with Gagagigo are Dimensional Prison and the infamous Compulsory Evacuation Device. Gagagigo also appears on Eater Millions card artwork in the top left hand corner. You can only really see the top half of the card, but he's there getting devoured. Going over every single card appearance would take a video itself, so let's just leave it at there for now. The next card on our list of old school cards is called Metal Dragon. This is a level 6 machine fusion monster with 1850 attack and 1700 defense. For its fusion summon, Metal Dragon needs Steel Ogre Grotto 1 and Lesser Dragon. Steel Ogre is a level 5 vanilla monster and Lesser Dragon is level 4 vanilla monster, and there really isn't anything special about them. Metal Dragon follows the same trend as a lot of early Yu-Gi-Oh fusion monsters, where the cards are subpar combinations of two random monsters into a slightly stronger vanilla monster. But even for its stats, Metal Dragon is a pretty bad card, all things considered. But why it's on this list is for the artwork of the card, and not for the reason you'd think. Yes, the actual Metal Dragon is cool and everything, but the background is what stands out. In that, the background is a random stock photo of some clouds, which is pretty funny if you ask me. I'm pretty sure you can just Google an image of clouds and find the same stock photo. Major props to the guy Konami who managed to slip this one by, and even after its release, Metal Dragon's background didn't change with time. They just kept it around, which I think makes the card even better. And because it's got the jokey background, the original card from Legend of the Blue Eyes White Dragon goes for a fair share of money. A good first edition copy of the card sells for around $50 USD, which is pretty crazy. Underdog is a continuous trap card that has the effect that during your turn, you can negate the effects of all face-up monsters your opponent controls, and the same happens to you on your opponent's turn, where all your monsters have their effects negated on your opponent's turn. This is definitely one of the more interesting floodgates out there, and can be utilized in a lot of different ways depending on the situation. But Underdog is a unique card because of its artwork, like all the other cards on this list. The artwork showcases four pretty well-known beast-type monsters. The four monsters that are featured are the cards Super Nimble Mega Hamster, Rescue Rabbit, Alpha the Master of Beast, and Behemoth the King of All Animals. Although there isn't any crazy story between all four of these monsters, other than the fact that all four of them saw competitive play in the past in different decks. The artwork is pretty funny and depicts Rescue Bunny who's beating up Behemoth and crying about to Alpha, despite Behemoth being, well, a behemoth of a monster by comparison to the small rescue rabbit. The best part of the card by far is the confused alpha because the script writer finds it adorable. There are much better floodgates out there like skill drain or imperial order and they are decently priced cards because they are valued cards. But a graded version of underdog sells at a surprisingly $80 which is weirdly high for a card like underdog because really it's not that good in the grand scheme of things. Now let's take a quick break from talking about car artworks and talk about the beautiful headhuntress. Headhuntress is a pretty standard level 4 vanilla earth warrior monster with 1600 attack and 800 defense. The flavor text of the card reads, a vicious creature that has decapitated numerous enemy monsters. Konami tends to have a habit of censoring cards when they get released to the world. There are normally four different types of artwork changes when it comes to Yu-Gi-Oh! There's guns and weapons, religious symbols, sexual content, and then violence. But for wording, the translation's localization teams are normally pretty tame. But Beautiful Headhuntress is different. 
It's one of the few rare cards that directly references death with the text saying that the Headhuntress has decapitated numerous enemy monsters. Also, Beautiful Headhuntress has a counterpart in Warrior of Tradition, which is a level 6 vanilla fusion monster with 1900 attack that needs Sonic Maid and Beautiful Headhuntress as its materials. There really isn't too big of a difference between the two monsters, other than a different color scheme and some better stats. But like Metal Dragon, the older fusion monsters are pretty bad and were just a combination of two random monsters for a slightly beefier beat stick. And because the text is definitely out of the ordinary, the card is pretty expensive given its mediocre stats, level, and attribute. However, as I just mentioned, Beautiful Headhuntress fetches a high price. Currently, it fetches a price of around $150, which is absolutely crazy considering how mediocre it is. A graded version of the card fetches an even higher price. Grading refers to the process of submitting cards to ensure their quality, like a jeweler for diamonds or something along those lines. So a graded version of Beautiful Headhuntress right now sells at a whopping $300. Last, but certainly not least, is Scrum Force. This continuous trap card was released in the 5D era and has the effect that while you control two or more face-up defense position monsters, your opponent cannot target defense position monsters you control for card effects and they cannot be destroyed by your opponent's card effects. And you get to keep Scrum Force in the field for a while with another part of its effect that allows it to destroy one card in your spell and trap card zone instead of itself when targeted for destruction. Scrum Force is kind of like the of the normal series of cards I mentioned earlier, but not so much in reference to that effect, but rather the artwork specifically. The artwork showcases a similar group of weak nor monsters banded together for one reason or another. Although they aren't as weak as the monsters showcased in the of the normal cards, as they are higher level, but they're still pretty weak nonetheless. The cards in Scrum Force are Oscolo Hero, Beaver Warrior, Jerry Beans Man, and the Thunder Kid. These monsters, as previously mentioned, are all level 2 to 4 normal monsters that really don't have anything special to them. No crazy stats or crazy secret attack with them. The only really notable one is Beaver Warrior and Jerry Beans Man, and that's only because he was one of the staples in Yugi Modem's decks back in the anime, and with Jerry Beans Man, as it's just a weirdly high attack plant monster with 1750 attack, which is well above average for level 3 monsters, even being the highest attack of all level 3 normal monsters. What's weird about this selection of monsters, however, is that all of them, except for Beaver Warrior, all have a higher attack than defense, which is the case for most monsters, honestly, for the game, but doesn't really make sense in relation to the effect of the card that focuses on having your monsters in defense position specifically. But back to the trap card itself. So the card is actually based on Team Tayo in the 5D's anime. This is the team that Yusei, the main character in his team, had to face off against during the World Racing Grand Prix tournament. And Team Taya was one of the filler teams before the heroes had to face off against some of the more villainous teams. But essentially, Team Taya had three members that all had decks that were mostly normal monsters. This was because, like Yusei's team, Team Taya came from poverty and worked their way up to the Grand Prix at a shot for a better life. How they did that with decks full of normal monsters, I have no ideas, but for plot reasons, they were there. Regardless, there wasn't much character arcs to them or any super crazy things going on with them, just some opponents with some backstory. The second part of the effect is related specifically to the anime itself with a duel between Yusei and the member of Tayo. Basically, one of the duelists from the team Tayo used the card Fake Trap to prevent the card from being destroyed. Fake Trap is an old school card that basically allows it to be destroyed rather than another trap card you control. So they just kind of added the effect into the card itself to have its own built-in protection. Alright, and that's our list for this episode of the unknown side of Yu-Gi-Oh! Are there any other obscure or new cards you'd like to see in the series? If so, let us know down in the comments below.